motto, motto. Uh, All my niggas hoopin' it, you ain't got no jumper Glizzy get the clap, met the shit sound like some thunder Tap the button on the bag and watch him do his dance You know this got through power punches, figure out how to stand Y'all talking about y'all shooters when y'all slide, they always miss They be known for running quick when we coming with the bliss uh, Got heavy sticks, ain't no running hollow tips Northeast High is one of the largest high schools in the city with more than 3,000 students. Eight of them were shot, one left in critical condition. The incident occurred on Wednesday, March 6, close to the Northeast High School, just as students were preparing to board their buses home. Around 3 p.m., surveillance footage released by the police captured three individuals wearing masks as they appeared around a corner in an intersection called Five Point and began shooting. The eight people shot ranged in age from 15 to 17. As of Monday, the police have confirmed that all victims are now in stable condition. This includes the 16-year-old who was critically wounded, having been struck by bullets nine times, according to ABC News. I don't know how teenagers get so bold, so reckless and sloppy to even begin to think that this was a good idea. How bad could you want to kill someone that you literally don't care who you shoot? Innocent kids, crossing guards, bus drivers, and whoever else was out there, there was no way that they were going to get away with this. We are going to do everything that we can to ensure your public health and safety, and we don't apologize for using every legal and constitutional tool in our tool belts in order to get that done. Adding parents need to step up too. I ask every parent today, go in those rooms and look under those tables and look under those, <coughs> those closets and get those guns out of the house. On March 2nd, this dark blue 2019 Hyundai Sonata was reported stolen from the 500 block of Kendrick Street in the far Northeast. In its place was another stolen Kia Sportage which was swapped. Four days later, four teens, all under the age of 19, would drive the blue Hyundai to the corner of Rising Sun and Cotman, get out and do the unthinkable. Police recovered the Hyundai in an alleyway between the 400 blocks of Fern Street and Rosalind Street around 10.30 p.m. They towed the car for further investigation. According to the affidavits of probable cause, a witness reported seeing two people commit the theft, breaking the window of the Hyundai and leaving a Kia Sportage they derived in, parked and running. The Kia, police later learned, had also been reported stolen late February from the 7800 block of Horrocks Street. Investigators acquired data from cell towers to verify the location of cell phones near the crime scene, the theft of the Kia Sportage, and the Hyundai Sonata theft. The probable cause affidavit noted the patterns of these devices match the suspect's movements as understood by the investigation at the moment. One of the mobile devices tracked through this method was associated with a woman previously identified in the school district records as the guardian of Anal Bugs. Evidence from both vehicles and the crime scene were recovered. As the crime scene unit was gathering DNA evidence from the vehicle, Law enforcement officers visited the 400 block of Fern Street to secure video recording. A particular video captured the moment the car entered the alley at 3.11 p.m. on Wednesday, just minutes after the shooting, revealing four individuals dressed in matching black outfits. These people were subsequently identified as suspects in the shooting based on the probable cause affidavits. After pulling into the alleyway, the suspects entered a residence on the block. This residence was later pinpointed by police through video analysis. In the early hours, authorities served the search warrant at the residence on the 400 block of Fern Street that we just spoke about. There, they discovered a polymer, 80 jig, a tool for assembling firearms from kits of the same brand, and mail addressed to Jamal Tucker Jr. A subsequent search at Tucker's house led to the seizure of 30 rounds of 45 caliber ammunition. Later that night, Tucker surrendered himself to police. During their investigation, authorities analyzed a prison phone call made by a man named Dantez McMillan, who is currently an inmate at SCI Pine Grove. The call was made to a number associated with a now Bugs. McMillan addressed a person on the other end as his nephew, and they referred to him as Unc. The conversation included McMillan asking, I heard about your man, you good? to which the response was a simple, nah, 
McMillan then noted, yeah, it's never easy to digest. From the contents of this call, officials inferred that the discussion was likely about the homicide of Damian Taylor that occurred on the 6200 block of Ogons Avenue just days earlier. Dame was killed at 3.45 p.m. on March 4th, just as Imhotep Charter School students were heading home. According to reports, two masked assailants in hoodies opened fire on students boarding a SEPTA bus. Damian Taylor, 17, was fatally shot multiple times and died shortly after. He was a student at the school. The attack also injured two other students from Imhotep, along with two women aged 50 and 71 who were on the bus. As of now, Philadelphia police have not dismissed the link between this incident and the other shooting, although they have not disclosed any potential motives. And I noticed that every single news article that I read about this makes it a point to mention that. Philadelphia police, together with the U.S. Marshals, apprehended a now Bugs without any complications. During a search of Bugs' residence, law enforcement officials found a 40 caliber Glock 22 handgun equipped with an extended magazine, a laser pointer, and a switch. Deputy Police Commissioner Frank Venora mentioned that an initial ballistics analysis suggests a match between the firearm recovered and the shell casings found in the location of the shooting at Rising Sun in Cotman. In a news conference announcing the arrest of Tucker and Bugs, police made clear that their investigation was continuing. Quote, anyone who may have aided and assisted them, we're coming for them too, said Venor. Jeremiah Carter, or Motto, was arrested around 3.30 p.m. on the 1200 block of Academy Road in Northeast Philadelphia, said Robert Clark, Supervisory Deputy U.S. Marshal with the Eastern Pennsylvania Violent Crime Fugitive Task Force. Carter was said to be relatively surprised when he was found, but he did not resist arrest. The Fugitive Task Force also contacted the family of a 17-year-old fourth suspect and told him that he had until the morning to surrender to Philadelphia police or else his name and photo would be made public and a reward announced for his capture. Quote, we gave them the ultimatum, turn your son in by tomorrow, Clark said, adding that the family was, quote, somewhat cooperative. This was the moment 19-year-old Jermaine Carter was walked out of his father's home on Academy Road close to Woodhaven. A rare midday capture by U.S. Marshals with Philadelphia police detectives on hand just 23 hours after Philadelphia city leaders had announced the arrest of the first two suspects in Wednesday's mass shooting of eight Northeast high school students at a SEPTA bus stop. Carter was number three, and moments after his 3.30 arrest, I spoke to his dad who had answered the front door when the marshals came knocking. What can you tell me happened with your son? Uh, I don't know. I just came to the door and two machine guns. You came to the door and they had machine guns in your face? What did they say to you? They just brought me outside. Yes, sir. Sorry, I need him. The marshals sat him down on the front steps, arms handcuffed behind his back, and snapped more photos of him being taken away into custody. The last and still not in custody in the shooting, fourth male wanted, is the only one who was a juvenile, a 17-year-old from Philadelphia's Germantown section. Marshall showed up at his family's home, too, to get him today, but he wasn't there. And they urged his family to get him to turn himself in for his own good and for his own safety, so street justice doesn't get to him before the criminal justice system does. Or does the family of the 17-year-old know that his life could be in danger if his name gets out there? Yes, that was explicitly expressed to them by myself. I said, we're all on the same side. We want to get your son in safely. I'm here to help you. I'm here to get your son in safely. We've gotten all these other individuals in safely. We can do it. Work with us. You have till tomorrow to get him in. Otherwise, the hunt will continue, and his picture will be released to the city of Philadelphia, and we'll be asking for the public's assistance, and on top of that, we'll be offering a cash reward. By Wednesday, March 13th, the 17-year-old hadn't turned himself in and as promised, his name and face was released to the public along with a reward for his capture. 
Short reminder, the authorities looking into this case have been saying from the get-go that there's a strong likelihood of retaliation between last Monday's first SEPTA bus stop shooting, where a 17-year-old was murdered in that one, and Wednesday's shooting, and more retaliation could follow, and so that is the thinking, and that's what they're hoping his family is thinking to help bring him in. This wasn't just another shooting in Philadelphia. Eight children were shot, and the mayor's administration and law enforcement weren't letting this one go easy. Immediately, the U.S. Marshal Service was on it and made it known that they were going to solve this crime. On Wednesday, March 6th, after the smoke cleared, within a matter of five seconds, eight students, aged 15 to 17, were struck by bullets. 30 shots in all were fired, according to police and video from the scene. Responding officers found the teens lying on a rainy, wet-soaked sidewalk in the road, blood soaking through their clothes and school uniform. Young friends and bystanders trying to hold pressure to their wounds, according to videos taken by witnesses. The family of 17-year-old Damian Taylor, a student at Imhotep Charter, who was tragically killed in the shooting incident, came together to commemorate and lay him to rest. Two other students from Imhotep sustained injuries, and two other women unaffiliated with any of this were also injured on the bus. A janazah was conducted for Taylor at the Khadijah Alderman Funeral Home on Friday morning, followed by his burial at Shelton Hill Cemetery. In the midst of their mourning, Taylor's family has opted not to make public statements. School representatives, however, remembered him as an intelligent and kind-hearted individual, brimming with school pride and hailing from a family with a strong legacy at Imhotep. As for the other survivors of the shooting, they have been on a path to recovery. A 16-year-old boy who suffered a bullet graze to the back of his left shoulder has been recuperating at home. His older brother, 21, shares that finding the solace in routine and activities like doing laundry, playing charades, and watching the latest Avatar series has been part of the healing process. Opting to remain anonymous for privacy concern, the brother revealed their family has leaned on the Christian face for support, taking solace in the fact that his brother is expected to make a full recovery within a couple of weeks, according to the Inquirer. Meanwhile, the families of the other victims were struggling to make sense of the violence that occurred on March 6th, how they could be swept up in a gun violence crisis that has become the leading cause of death for children in America. 24 children in Philadelphia died last year from gunfire. Some were as young as two, sleeping in cribs, focused on teddy bears, newly discovering the world around them. Others were teenagers who played in high school sports teams, served in student government, or dreamed of starting businesses, read an article by the Philadelphia Inquirer, written by Ellie Rushing, which was published on January 29th, 2024. All were shot in the sections of the city where the majority of residents are black and where about 30% of residents live in poverty. Most lived in areas already touched by violence. At least eight had an immediate family member who had been shot before. One boy had been injured in a shooting months before he was killed and went on to read. Trauma plays a significant role in both the perpetuation and experience of gun violence affecting individuals and communities in a cyclical and complex manner. Many young boys who join gangs or engage in what we see the drill rappers doing today have experienced significant trauma in their life, such as family violence, community violence, poverty, racial discrimination, or the loss of loved ones. For some, gangs or block affiliations may offer a sense of belonging, protection, or a way to cope with their experiences. The trauma that precedes involvement with the streets can affect young teens' emotional regulation and decision-making, making them more susceptible to engaging in risky or violent behavior. Participation in gang street activities often exposes these young boys to further traumatic events, including witnessing or participating in gun violence, which can exasperate pre-existing trauma. This exposure can lead to a range of traumatic stress responses, including PTSD, anxiety, depression, and substance abuse as coping mechanisms. Trauma can fuel a cycle of violence within gangs, Individuals who have experienced trauma may be more likely to engage in violence as means of asserting control, seeking revenge, or expressing anger and pain. 
This behavior can trigger retaliation from rival gangs or within their own gangs, leading to further violence and trauma. The trauma experienced by members can create significant barriers to exiting gang life. Traumatic stress symptoms and peer pressure can make it challenging to engage with support services, maintain employment, and rebuild social connections outside of the gang. Additionally, the stigma and isolation experienced by former gang members can exasperate feelings of depression and hopelessness. There are interventions aimed at reducing gang violence and supporting individuals involved in gangs. These programs must address the underlying trauma to be effective, meaning using trauma-informed care that recognizes the impact of gun violence and being victims of crimes, as well as community-based programs that aim to heal and strengthen communities affected by murder and living in a war zone. 19-year-old Jeremiah Carter was taken into custody in Northeast Philadelphia. Carter was charged with attempted murder, aggravated assault, and related crimes. Carter is being held on a total of $4 million bail, plus a stay-away order for his eight victims. 18-year-olds Jamal Tucker and Anal Bugs are charged with attempted murder, aggravated assault, and related crimes. Tucker is being held on a total of $16 million bail, plus a stay-away order for the eight victims. Anal Bugs is being held on a total of $16 million bail, plus a stay-away order for the eight victims. Asir Boone, 17, is wanted on attempted murder and related charges, according to a statement from the U.S. Marshal Service. All four teens are innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. I'm going to leave it there for now. Thanks for watching American Confidential. And until next time, of course, be safe.